of 22 black community groups disgusted by gun murders in the city wants a separate set of rules and institutions for blacks. And this is from the Toronto Sun. Separate rules and institutions. A whole coalition of 22 groups. The article continues. Margaret Parsons, executive director of the African Canadian Legal Clinic, says... Canada's vaunted policy of multiculturalism has blinded authorities to systemic racism against blacks. Even as they adopt policies of inclusion and integration. Now, the poor bloody white man just can't get it right, can he? Here he is adopting policies of inclusion and integration, but all that does is blind him to systemic racism against blacks. And I am still supposed to believe that racial diversity is a strength. Of course, now you have a problem with Muslims. Just last summer, police arrested a group that were planning to storm the parliament building, hold parliamentarians hostage, perhaps even behead the prime minister. More strength, I suppose. But on a somewhat lighter note, Toronto's Muslims take their children out of classes that are designed to give them the right attitude towards homosexuals so frequently that the Toronto Prime Minister had to get involved. Dalton McGuinney himself had to beg Muslims to let their children take these classes. Well, diversity is a mighty tricky business. Then there's Canada's oldest experiment in racial diversity. That is to say relations between whites and aboriginals. Now, this must be a very strong relationship indeed, because it goes back the farthest. And if diversity is strength, this would be mighty, mighty strong. Well, it was even used in America. When Indians took over the town of Caledonia, Ontario, and chased out all the white people. Now, McLean's Magazine warns of more in an article of December 27th of 2006. They say, quote, Canada should brace for more dramatic displays of Aboriginal defiance in 2007 warn Native leaders who say that the First Nations frustration that boiled over in a small Ontario town this year may well be the tipping point for decades of simmering Aboriginal anger. Simmering Aboriginal anger. Decades of it. I guess it must be another strength that somehow went wrong. On the very day of the McLean's article, you know what the Mohawk Nation News says? I don't suspect you read that too often, but what they said was, quote, I'll quote again, don't get any ideas that we'll become Canadians. No way. We can and will handle our own affairs, so get out of our way while the going is good. Canada, you know, everything belongs to us, and we're getting it all back. Ladies and gentlemen, let's face the facts squarely. Racial diversity in Canada, just as it is in the United States, is an ordeal. If it were a strength, non-whites wouldn't set up countless groups to promote their interests. If it were a strength, no one would need diversity managers, sensitivity training. If it were a strength, you wouldn't need commissions, tribunals, councils to solve the problems it creates. And just take a look around the world. Wherever people are killing each other most diligently, they're killing each other because of diversity, whether it's religion, race, language, that is why people are at each other's throats. The Soviet Union broke up because of race and ethnicity. So did Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Zimbabwe is expelling white farmers only because they're white. Now, diversity therefore of the kind that Canada is promoting is one of the most obviously divisive forces on the planet. How anyone can consider it a strength, I don't know. But my 20 minutes are up. So I guess we will now find out from Professor March. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. <laughs> Sir March. Yes, well, I suppose we should begin uh, by clarifying the concept of racially diverse. When Canadians say that uh, they aim to have a racially diverse society, the emphasis isn't actually on the racial. It's diverse and it's society. So when we say that we value a racially diverse society, we're saying that we value the possibility of different kinds of people living together peacefully. Different kinds of people profiting from each other's differences. We have a whole variety of different kinds of people in Canada. They're here. The racial diversity is a reality. 
our aim when we say we want a racially diverse society is, of course, we mean by society the peaceful and profitable interaction between peoples who are racially diverse. Now, there is another advantage. Just as Jared says, uh, all around the world, racism burns strong. And it is a great thing if we can prove that it's possible for the different races to live together peacefully in Canada. If we did that, we would be mighty proud. So my first point is that the great advantage of racial diversity is the great advantage of racially diverse society. And the great advantage of that is peace, security, uh, health benefits, good education, equality, democracy. These are enormous benefits. And our point about racially diverse society is that we wish to extend all these benefits to all the different kinds of people in Canada. How there could be any doubt about such a project, how you could be in any way scornful of our effort to provide for everyone good education, good health care, a part in government, etc. How Jared can somehow twist his mind around to the idea that that would not be a highly desirable result, given that we do have a variety of races in Canada, if that's where you want to talk. I would say a variety of colors and variety of cultures, but never mind. Let's call it races. So first, that little clarification. What we would be proud of would be a successfully, a positive racial relationships between all the different races in Canada. Not just having them, we're not pretending that just having them is somehow a badge like a Boy Scout collecting different colored badges. We're suggesting that we want something a little bit more sophisticated. That is say, a sophisticated way of living together, loving each other, caring for each other, protecting each other, admiring each other, respecting, enjoying each other. So it's not just races, that's the nonsense of racism. It's people living together and profiting from each other's society. My second point would be that I, I will not deny that Canadians often uh, decry the fact there's a great deal of racism in Canada. In fact, I'm not even here to deny that there's a lot of racism in Canada. Uh, recently, the statistic came out that 57% of Quebecers self-describe as somewhat racist. And I think if you did the same uh, decimal research in Nova Scotia, you might well get a higher result than that. You might well get the result that, say, 60 or 65 percent of Nova Scotians would self-describe as somewhat racist. So the, the issue is between us is not whether there's this distress between the groups. The issue is the cause. And that puts the lie to Jared's claim when he says, I've got the easy job. All I have to do is describe reality. On the contrary, he is not just describing reality. The heart and soul of what Jared has said so far is to ascribe a reason for these unhappy events. And the reason he wants to give is that there are racial differences between the people, that the high crime rate that the crimes of, uh, against persons and the crimes against property, that this high crime rate has to be attributed to something called the race of the people involved. Well, it's not true. Anyone taking an introductory course in criminology will learn very early on that the statistical correlation is to poverty and to abuse. That is what causes a high crime rate. If you take two white communities living beside each other, one, a large, poor white community, and another, a middle-sized, middle-class, or upper-middle-class white community, you will find that the crime rates in the one is 10 times the crime rate in the other. Now, partly that has to do with crime reporting statistics. Partly it has to do with if you have a lot of money, you can get off. Partly it has to do with many things. But the statistics will show you that the correlation is between poverty and abuse of existence, particularly abuse of childhood and uh, the crime rate. Now, in Canada, as in the United States, blacks happen to be members of the groups that are very, very poor. So the correlation that Jared is actually claiming to notice between race and crime is not there. It's a correlation of poverty and abuse to crime. Now, should we give up 
Jared says, because it's a race problem, give it up. You can't change people's genes. That's the argument underneath. Now notice, that's not a description of reality. That's an attribution of a cause. If you want to attribute a cause, you can't do it by just looking. And you can't do it just by establishing a simple correlation. And the students who hear this should think about the difference between the word cause and the word correlation. There is indeed a correlation between races and crime. But the cause is deeper. The cause, in fact, is poverty, and we can prove that. Because we will find the same ratios between two communities that are white as between a community that's white and black, providing one is poor and the other one is not. Now that lesson about the difference between cause and correlation is an introductory point made in every statistical course, including logic. It's made in psychology, it's made in criminology, it's made in sociology. And if a student gets out of first year university without knowing the difference between getting a correlation and getting a cause, he or she has failed to become educated in the most minimal way. And yet, here is our speaker making that crushing mistake of thinking that because he can show that the crime rates among people of a certain color is high, that therefore that color is the cause of the high crime rate. Or some hidden, non-describable, mysterious genetic component of their makeup which makes them into criminals. Funny that the, the so-called white races become criminals when they're poor as well. Should, should we give up? Yes, give up, he says. It's a race problem. It's built in. My answer is no, it's not built in. It's a problem of poverty and abuse. And let me now say how we achieve the highly desirable racially diverse society. And when I say society, I mean a group of people living together with love, with respect, with interest in each other, and a willingness to share education and insights. How do you achieve that? According to Jared, of course, it's hopeless because it's a racial problem. And you can't dig out people's genes and change them. They're always going to be rotten. But if it's a poverty problem, then we can begin to look at it. We can begin to resolve it. We simply address the question of, for example, prejudice in the workplace. And we start making sure that we get as many as possible of the racial mixtures into our companies. What is the advantage, says Jared? Can you prove, Peter, that a company with a racially diverse uh, clientele is going to be more productive? Is going to sell more televisions? No, I can't, as a matter of fact. And research like that, I would say rather stupid research, has been tried. There is no evidence that mixed races, no strong evidence that mixed races in companies or in societies gives them any particular advantage. But there's a great evidence for the fact that racially mixed societies living together is a boon and a beautiful thing and a wonderful thing that we all can enjoy and be very, very proud of. So how do we overcome poverty? That's an economics question. It's not a question for a race fatalist. Jared is not a realist, he's a fatalist. He doesn't see the simple solution that there is in fact a problem of poverty. Now where did the poverty come from? Well, that goes to Jared's ancestors, doesn't it? And how they behaved. I'm assuming his ancestors are Virginian. His accent seems to indicate that. If not, I apologize. But in any case, America brought these diverse people to America, enslaved them, denied them proper income, denied them proper education, denied them proper health, denied them security of the body, denied them the, the most minimal standards of justice, treated them with violence and cruelty, and I would say sadistically by any modern standard. They were treated for that in that way for 150, 200 years. And that's not the worst of it. These very people can look back on history, history that I would teach them, that says that even when they were so-called granted their freedom in 1866, around the time of the Civil War, even then, for another 100 years, they were denied the vote, they were denied education, they were denied justice before the courts, they were denied security, they were denied self-respect, they were ground down as badly as if they were slaves in the previous period. We're now looking at 250 years of cultural destruction, of humiliation, of undermining people's sense of personhood. Now suddenly Jared says, look at this, we can't seem to get along with them now that in the last 30 years we've decided to try and treat them like people, give them the vote, etc.
can't seem to get along with them. It's absolutely hopeless. It's because they're black. <laughs> 